So probably a lot of you heard, oh, it's DNS fault. If something is not working in the internet, you cannot get to your website, which you are trying to visit. But I will not speak about it. It's not, it is not always DNS fault. I will rather speak about threat intelligence and how you can use DNS to create a threat intelligence. So I will put you in the shoes of threat intelligence analyst today. And you will also learn what, why I put Alice in Wonderland on the first mm -hmm. picture and we will see her on more slides. Okay, so just quickly, who am I? I am cyber threat intelligence analyst at Quad9. Quad9 is a nonprofit organization and we provide DNS but I am also cyber threat intelligence analyst at Switch, which probably most of you here know. And there I am mostly focusing on threat actor profiling, creating threat landscape for Switzerland and global organization. And apart from this, before I joined Quad9, I used to work at UB as a senior cyber threat intelligence analyst. But cyber is not whole word for me. So I also am, I am interested in fashion in my free time. So what I would like you to learn today is what is the difference between DNS and protective DNS? What is the role of DNS in cyber attacks in today? Uh, and what is the cyber threat intelligence and how you can use cyber threat intelligence to protect your organization? And finally, I will put you in the shoes of threat intelligence analysts and we will try to create threat intelligence to protect our organization, so imaginary organization. Okay, so I think probably some of you know what DNS is, but I think it's always too good to have this refresher. So DNS stands for domain name system. So let's say one day you want to go to womaninsyber.ch page. The problem is that internet doesn't understand human words. It only understands numbers. So like a long, long time ago when internet was created, we came with the solution DNS, which is responsible for transla translating words into numbers. So what this service does, it takes an, um, uh, this woman in cyber.ch and it translates it to IP address. So you can compare it to a phone book because you take a name of the person and it's translated to the phone address. And in this case, it's a phone number. In this case, it's IP address. And once you have the IP address, you can see the content of woman in cyber. So how it is different to protective DNS? So again, we have the same system, so word to number translation, but we have one additional component, which is database. Database contains entries where you have domain and specification if the domain is malicious or not. So what, let's say we are trying now to, we are again, this Alice sitting in front of the computer, we are trying to go to this strange website, wakequence.com. So what our protective DNS is, in this case could be, for example, Quad9, it checks if the domain is malicious. If it is, you will not see the content of the page. You will be not able to download anything from this page. So it means you will be protected from malware, cyber criminals, phishing attacks, etc., scam. And this can serve first protective measures for the organization, but it also can serve educational purposes. So the user will be informed that he, he or she tried to access malicious website. Okay, so as I said, DNS is since the beginning of the internet, and I don't think anything will change. So of course, cyber criminals use and abuse DNS. And they use it in different kinds of attacks. They use it in phishing attacks. They use it to download additional malware to your computer. They use DNS to 
blend malicious traffic into legitimate traffic, so they are not detected that easily by your SOC analysts, for example. And there are many, many other cyber attacks where cyber criminals use and, as I said, abuse DNS. Okay, so now another definition, because I promised that we will create threat intelligence. So what is threat intelligence? Threat intelligence, in a very simple term, is information about the threat, which should help your stakeholders, so your senior management, SOC analysts, IT service manager, protect the organization. So it's not just single IP address. It needs to have a context for your senior stakeholders to be able to do something with this information and protect the organization. And as I said, you have different types of stakeholders. They have different types of understanding of cybersecurity. So that's why we have different types of threat intelligence. If you have a CISO, he will probably, he or she will probably not understand reverse reversing of the code of the malware. So you want to go with strategic intelligence, which is very high level, and they will be able to understand and act with act upon this information. If you have a SOC analyst, he's not interested in what kind of risk this attack will cause to the organization. He or she is only interested how they can mitigate the attack or how they can block the attack. So they will be more interested in, for example, technical intelligence. And as I said, depending on your stakeholder, you want to create different type of threat intelligence. Okay, so we are now getting into threat analyst shoes. So we have, we go back to this now we already know malicious domain, wakefrequence.com, and what we can do. So this is the typical day of CTI analyst. So you have a SOC analyst who is claiming that they see a lot of queries to this malicious domain, and they want to know something more, what, what this domain is, what is sitting behind this domain. So you are this poor Alice, and this is your job to do some open source intelligence and some pivoting on this domain to get some intelligence. Okay, so now we are coming to the part why I mentioned Alice so many times. So as I said, creating threat intelligence is creating information for your stakeholder. But you need to know which path to take to prepare the intelligence for the specific stakeholder. If you don't know the stakeholder, of course you can take anywhere, but you will have to long, go long enough and maybe you will not get a result that you are looking for. And as an Alice, you also need to know the tools you can get specific threat intelligence. So there are many different tools on the markets. They are paid. They're, they are open source. I will focus on in this presentation only on the open source, so the resources which are free, because I know many organizations cannot afford 20 vendors to get intelligence from. So basically what you can do, you could also sit later on at home and do the same thing I did in front of your computer. So as I said, I will be focusing mostly on the open source intelligence. I will be focusing on some tools in the, which are free to everyone. So we can start with the victimology. So victimology is who was targeted by attack. And if you, for example, use a protective DNS, uh, you can see where the users were coming from, where they tried to query domain. And this is actual data from Quad9, and there is no, no, there is a reason why I took this specific domain, because this is one of the most queried domains at Quad9 we block. So you will now learn what is one of the most common attacks targeting population in the United States. What we can do with this domain is we can take it to who is, who is this like a address book of the internet. So you can see there who tried to register the domain. 
And if you are a cyber threat intelligence analyst, you will probably think, aha, I know this registrar, it's Russian registrar, and it's used by many cyber criminals because they are very bad at in taking down domains. So if you are a cyber criminal, you can register a domain and be sure that it will not disappear after one week or even one day of your attack. So you can run this attack for months, weeks, even years. We see, I think this was registered in 2022 and it's still there. So what you could also do is you could do passive DNS. So checking passive DNS is the history of the domain. So you could check to which, so you have an IP, you have a, this domain and you could check to which which other domains did I, this IP address where we see it on the, in the first row was resolving to. And here you already have another indicator which you could share with SOC analyst. So we have another very similar domain. So way quens without E, which is probably malicious. So we could block it so our users do not try to enter this domain next week, for example. What you can do is you can use also virus total. This is a very popular tool among cyber experts. And what I did, I took again the same domain and I was able to find a hash of the malware sample. And virus total gives you this opportunity to download malware to your machine. You shouldn't do it on your machine. You always should do it in the secure environment. But what I did, I took it to the sandbox, sandbox. And sandbox is sandbox, but for malware. So you put the malware and let it play and see what is going on. And you already see here that the sandbox found out that the malware is your sniff. I will tell more about this later, but we already have a name of the malware. We have also some behaviors which could be useful for us and for our, for example, reverse engineers. We can go down the rabbit hole. So again, we are coming back to uh, Alice and we could see some additional indicators. So new domains, which we again could block, new IP addresses, which we could then also analyze and check if there are any new domains which we would like to block. We also can get from this sandbox report techniques and tools used by cyber criminals. This could be useful, for example, for our threat modeling team. So you see we are building and building more and more information depending what stakeholder you want to target, you will then later on use um, different type of information. And finally, one cool feature about Sun sandboxes are, is that they also give you links to the articles written by the vendors. So we had luck, we were lucky, <laughs> because VMware wrote an article about this specific malware. So here you already can see that this is, we confirmed that this is oversniff Gauzy malware, and this is a banking Trojan. So it will probably target most of the population in general worldwide because everyone is using banking and this malware is targeting your information, banking information, banking credentials. And one of the one additional information which we could see is how users are usually infected by this malware. So we have additional information. So usually um, users, when they are infected with this malware, they try to download malicious Microsoft programs and they execute it thinking that this will be a Microsoft program, but what they get is first malware, but loader, which then downloads. So it uses DNS to download Ursniff and Gozi, so our final payload which we found on virus total. Okay, so we gathered a lot of information now what we can do with it. Mm -hmm. So as I said, threat intelligence is all about stakeholders. So 
If you want to write a report for a CISO, you will be focusing on strategic intelligence. So you will write very high level uh, summary of what happened, what kind of users were impacted, where they were sitting. Maybe you can even get information in which division of the organization they were sitting. And you can also name very high level information that it was a banking trojan. So you have one short report for senior management. Then for SOC analyst, we found a lot of indicators. So we found IOCs, so IP addresses, hashes, domains. They can now take these new indicators and block so our users don't try to download additional malware. <laughs> or new users don't try to download new malware on their machines. I mentioned also that we found these techniques and tools used by threat actors. So this we could use for threat modeling team for tactical intelligence. Yeah. So this will protect us to, from similar attacks, not the same ones, ones we, we just analyze, but just similar. So in case we ever, this group ever tried to launch new attack, but using different domains, our systems will be able to detect it. And then finally, we shouldn't forget about security awareness team. I'm always told at Switch that <laughs> security awareness is important. So we have idea for a new awareness campaign. So we could try to design a campaign where we, for example, target our users internally with the CEO poisoning and fight Microsoft executables to show them that such attack exists and how they should behave. Okay, so I hope this presentation was useful for you. <laughs> and you learned what DNS is. I'm sure some of you already knew, but it was a nice refresher. And what is the difference with protective DNS? What is the role of DNS in cyber attacks? And what is cyber threat intelligence and how it can be useful for your organization to be more secure? And finally, I hope you learned how my day, like normal day as a cyber threat intelligence analyst looks like. Thank you. Thank you very much. It was very interesting, Emilia. And uh, I have some questions and maybe the audience as well. Um, first of all, I would like to know, does every company need to implement a threat intelligence program now or? I would say, I think this is a very controversial question because threat intelligence nowadays is a very like, fancy word. Everyone wants to have threat intelligence. But I think this is the last step in your organization. So once your organization is mature with other pro security programs, so you have SOC working, vulnerability management working, then you can start thinking about threat intelligence. But it shouldn't be let's as a first step to have threat intelligence and then everything else will come later. It should be the last step. And if I'm interested to have that, so if I have a company, I don't have one, unfortunately, but if my company wants to implement a threat intelligence program, so how does that work? Or what are the first steps? I would say first question I would ask, do you have a budget for this or not? <laughs> <laughs> yep. If you, normally yeah. companies don't have budget, but as I showed you, it's a lot of open source information lying around. So where I would start, I would start with identifying what are the risks to your organization? Are, is there, are, are there more threat, uh, threat actors or cyber criminals who are more interested in targeting financial sector? And now you already have a big group of cyber criminals to track and to see how they can impact your organization or are you a software company where you are afraid of um, espionage or your information being leaked then you have another group of threat actors so i would start with identifying so-called threat landscape for you and what could impact your organization and what risk there are to your organization okay and 
am I right that uh, every bank or finance in the finance in industry, every bank has a threat assessment, right? Or am I wrong? I wouldn't go that far. From what I know, not many banks in Switzerland have threat intelligence. I think in the United States, it's more popular. But I think this is changing. So more and more banks are interested in having because they see risks. And very often cyber criminals are interested, especially in getting money. They do it for money. And banks are the, they have money <laughs> to, to get. So. Okay. And if someone now here is interested to work in the threat intelligence uh, world, because you did a really um, good presentation and someone is really convinced now, so what are the first steps or what would you recommend and what do I have to study? I mean, I'm a lawyer, so as a lawyer, I don't have any chance to work in your or am I wrong? I think you are wrong because, <laughs> sorry, but I think threat intelligence is very broad. So for example, maybe you are, as a lawyer, you are interested in geopolitics. And for example, war in Ukraine showed that we also need people who know geopolitics. So how, for example, war, can impact cyber world because it was impacting. We, s we have seen DDoS attacks against many organizations in Switzerland as well, I think. So I would say as a lawyer, you can start with geopolitics and thinking like how geopolitical events can impact cyber world. But if you are interested in languages, for example, then you could start analyzing darknet or deep web forums and seeing how threat actors behave and what they are talking about, for example, what kind of organization they are trying to target. If you are interested more in analytics, then I would start with simple exercises like this. Get a simple IOCs or domains and try to deep, go deep, deeper and deeper what kind of information you can find in the internet. Okay. So everybody, actually not everybody, but nearly everybody has a chance to start working uh, in your world. And I see that there's a question from the audience. Yes. Um, maybe you can wait for the microphone. Um, so then you don't have to scream. Thanks. Um, thank you so much. Um, just to, I'm, I'm Cornelia. We're colleagues at Switch. Um, just one more thing, because I'm a great fan of Quad9. I'm not sure everyone really knows what Quad9 is, or maybe everyone does, but what do you think are the advantages of using Quad9 as a DNS resolver? I would say, first of all, you wouldn't be impacted by <laughs> one of the main threats, so banking Trojan. And we work with, like, we are non-profit, but we work with 20 different threat intel providers, so vendors, and they give us domains. So we have pretty good coverage among different types of malware and attacks. So I think, and we are also caring for your privacy. So we will not log where you try to access, for example, which domains you are trying to query. We anonymize this information. So privacy is also important for us. Thanks. Okay, we have another question just here. Thank you uh, for the talk. I have a question about the stakeholders. I was maybe missing a little bit um, the whole offensive side of security here because I think, I mean, given that the company has an offensive security um, area or is working together with, with uh, pen testers or red teams or whatever, where do you think is the most, or where should the touch point between uh, like threat intelligence and, and more the offensive side be, or do you think it's more going over the step of the SOC analyst or over the step of the CISO that then gives that down to, to more that side? I think it's pretty... So when I worked at UBS, we worked with Red Team pretty closely. And I would say the biggest advantage of threat intelligence for Red Team is this tactical uh, intelligence. So the, I mentioned here threat modeling team, but it could be also Red Team who could benefit because you could try to use the similar tools threat actors are using and try to target your organization. So I would say tactical is the most appropriate. But yeah, we worked pretty closely with red team at UPS, so they are not left out. <laughs> Thanks. 
I saw that there's another question just here from Karin. Hi, um, thank you so much for your presentation. I was wondering how do you prioritize uh, which rabbit hole to go down? This is what I mentioned by you need to know your path because you need to the first step, one of the first step when you try to build a threat intelligence program is also understanding what your stakeholders are. So talking to people and talking to different teams, like how would it be helpful? And of course, you always have this problem. I think this is also right for pen testing and red teaming. You try to, oh, this is interesting. I will go deeper and deeper and deeper. And suddenly your manager comes and asks you for a report and you are completely on the other side of the internet. So it's just, I think it comes from experience as well, where you need to know when to stop and when to say, when you need to say it's enough. I have enough for my stakeholders to make them happy and they can make informed decisions to protect the organization. Okay, I guess we have one last question. Time for one last question. I'm wondering uh, what's your position on using proxies with a protected DNS? Because to me, it seems quite similar in function. And for companies who are already using a proxy server, does it make sense to still use your protected DNS? I think it always makes sense to add additional layer of protection. This is how we always operated at, at UBS, that you always need to add additional layer because you never know when something will be vulnerable in your proxy or something like this. So I think it still makes sense. But honestly, I am not an expert on proxy, so I don't want to tell something wrong. But I would say it always makes sense to add additional layers. So I guess if you still have questions from, uh, or you want to ask something, Amelia, because we have a tough schedule, <laughs> and then please ask her during the break. She will also be here, right? Yes. Okay, and then I would like to go over to the first panel discussions, and thank you very much.